I want to talk a little bit about suicide, which is related to the class of disorders we were talking about last time, which is depression. It's also related to other disorders. There's elevated risk for suicide with a lot of disorders, including things like schizophrenia, bipolar. Clearly, most people see the connection with depression, uh, substance abuse, et cetera, et cetera. So suicide is something that is a terrible, terrible outcome for what we think, by and large, in the mental health profession is a preventable issue, something that usually can be treated if a person is aware that such treatments are available, if they are empowered and enabled to access such treatments, usually the critical issues that lead them to the choice of attempt of suicide are things that could be resolvable, which is why people can be hospitalized against their will. The way I look at it, if you're completely depressed, usually you're thinking, we talked about the cognitive triad is skewed, right? That you have a bias towards seeing things in a negative way, more black and white thinking. And from my way of looking at it, the worst time to make a life and death decision is when you're affected by depression or some other kind of really heavy life issue that prevents you perhaps from seeing all options. So you look at suicide, look at about a quarter million attempts a year. Shh, text, text, text. Quarter million people, about one in eight are completed. We don't say they're successful, that sounds terrible. All right, they complete suicide. So most suicide attempts are not completed, but those which are, are devastating to the person's family who lost them. Perhaps, in some sense, that person's suffering is over, whatever led them to that. But as I said, by and large, if we could have gotten them into treatment or gotten them some assistance or some help, we probably could have helped them solve the problem. Anybody could commit suicide. We do see higher numbers in singles, unemployed, college students, and high pressured professionals. There's certain demographics that have higher numbers than others, but it's an equal opportunity thing. Turns out, and you got the little asterisk there, if you saw that as a bonus item for your test, right? Females attempt suicide more often. Males complete suicide more often. There are some open questions as to why that might be the case, but one uh, leading concept or idea is that men are far more likely to use um, violent means of death. Men are much more likely to use hanging, right, which is a very, if, if, done is very effective. They're more likely to use guns, which again, very effective means. Women are more likely to use poisoning or um, uh, carbon monoxide asphyxiation, that kind of thing. Things that take time to occur, right? If you take an overdose of drugs, you had to have taken a drug that could be fatal in overdose. You had to have taken it in a quantity that would be fatal. In other words, a true overdose. And then that takes time at which point people can be discovered, rushed to the hospital and saved. Uh, after a gunshot wound or a dropped hanging, there's very little you can do unless there was some kind of serious, um, you know, a serious wound that was not fatal, in which case you might be able to save a life. About two-thirds of people admit in college to have, think, have thought about suicide. It's not an uncommon thing to think. I mean, in, in, in some ways, if you are philosophically minded at all, how would you get around the notion of thinking what it might be like not to be here, right? I mean, kind of how do we define our presence is by just the concept of like, what, what if I hadn't have been born? Or what if, what if I did die? What would happen? Those are not pathological things. Clearly, that's normative, right? We look at statistical normality, normal curve. More people have thought about it than haven't thought about it. So we're not just talking about thinking about it. We're talking about moving from a place where it goes from a thought to maybe a plan, to maybe executing that plan. There are a lot of myths surrounding um, suicide that people who talk about it, they don't actually do it, they're just looking for attention. I will tell you this, that is unlikely in most cases, and, and it tells you something very serious. If somebody was to be attempting to get attention through that means, there's something wrong, right? Most people don't attempt to get attention by feigning suicidal thoughts. So people who talk about it sometimes do it, but people don't oftentimes talk about it, and fewer people will talk with them about it. I train healthcare professionals. I am an instructor in an interprofessional communication course. I teach uh, medical students, nursing students, pharmacy students, in addition to psychology doctoral students. Right? I'm adjunct in the faculty, uh, adjunct faculty in the Department of Family Medicine. To 
have health professionals interface with their patients whenever they suspect there might be some kind of depression or potential for suicidality. Because if you don't train them to do it, people don't ask. And a lot of people who have completed suicide, I can't remember the exact number, but it's in excess of 50%, had been at their primary care provider in the 30 days prior to a completed suicide where I would say most of them were never asked whether they were suicidal or not. They were probably talking about depression issues, possibly anyway. They were probably offered antidepressant medication, but they probably weren't engaged in a prolonged conversation about suicidal possibilities because it's a very uncomfortable place to go. It opens up a can of worms. There's a lot of time pressures. And additionally, people don't know what to do about it. They are, they are hamstrung to have a conversation where they don't know what they're supposed to do. So we train people, but even after people are trained, I've seen this in that class, a, a fine class it is, let me tell you, to train people in communication skills. Most people just think, I'm pretty good at communicating. Not probably not. Not, not in a clinical interaction without some training. You can certainly enhance your communication abilities. But even after we train them specifically on this, there's a final test where they engage working with a model patient, an actor pretending to be a patient, where the issue is depression, and most of them don't ask about suicide after having been trained to do so. I did that with RAs. Y'all know RAs, right? Resident advisors, resident assistants in dorms. They have levels of responsibility. They're supposed to be looking out. They're kind of the eyes and ears of the university. At Virginia Tech, I took part in training a bunch of RAs on the issue of suicide. And then we went through a mock up situation where we had an actor in a dorm room, high rise, what looked like it might have been the butt of a gun sticking out from under some books, some pill bottles on the desk, darkened room, and a person just kind of sitting on the edge. And nobody in that group who had been trained to ask about suicide asked about suicide. It just didn't do it, despite the training. It's a hard thing to handle. So people have to be aware that you need to talk to people. People who talk about it have a better chance of getting out of it. If they don't talk about it, they oftentimes aren't made aware that there are other options. So I would encourage you to talk with people about it without feeling the responsibility to save them because that you cannot necessarily do. Although you might save them indirectly by getting them help. Suicide happens without warning? Not really, not usually. It seems to sometimes because we ignored the warning signs and retrospectively like, I didn't see that coming. But many times you can see it coming. People who attempt suicide are intent on dying. They just want to die anyway. There are some cases where people have clarity of mind where they make a, a reasonable choice. In those cases, we look at things like physician-assisted suicide where you have a chronic disease that's incredibly painful, not a cure in sight, and the person has to have the presence of mind to make a rational decision. And even then, there are a lot of legal hurdles. And there's a lot of people who debate whether that should even be allowed. And that's, that's a moral debate. Right? But the fact is, is the people who are allowed to do it have presence of mind. Right? They have to go through a process where they demonstrate they're competent to make that kind of decision. But most people who attempt suicide don't really want to die. Two-thirds of them at least don't want to die. Almost another third are ambivalent. I'm not really sure whether I did or didn't want to die. What they usually see is no other option. They feel pressed against a wall and they don't know what to do. And because they have this critical issue in their life that oftentimes leads them to feel ashamed or to feel hopeless or to feel like they, they have to unburden other people, they make this decision. I worked with a guy once and he had a job working on high power tension lines, had been doing it for decades, was nearing retirement. This is an upstanding member of the community. He was in the emergency room in the middle of the night when I got called in on call to talk to the man because his wife had found out he... He had admitted to her that he was thinking about suicide, but he wanted to make it look like an accident so it wouldn't nullify his insurance policy because he wanted to take care of his family. What had happened was he had developed a phobia to working on those lines. He couldn't explain it. Y'all now know quite a bit about how that might have occurred, right? All those years, it just blew his mind that he could no longer do that. So he'd been laying out of work. And laying out of work was causing problems with work, and he didn't see how he could ever go back 
And so he just thought, well, I'm the provider. I can't do what I'm supposed to do as a man, so I might as well just off myself and get the insurance money to my family. Of course, his wife was horrified at that concept. Right? She didn't want to lose her husband because he didn't think he could do that kind of job. And I had a conversation with the man, a conversation with him. I work no magic. No therapist works magic. We just talked. And I said, well, would you consider going to the hospital? He's like, I, I really can't. I'm supposed, I have to go to work tomorrow. I've already laid out a lot of days. And I said, so, so clarify with me this. You are pretty intent on dying. He's like, yeah. And I'm like, but you got to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> you couldn't go to the hospital because it's a life or death situation. He's like, wow, I never really thought of it like that. He never really thought of it like that. He didn't think of a lot of other things, like maybe he could transfer to his desk job, right, in the same corporation, right? There were a lot of options possibly open to him, but he had never engaged in a process of rational decision making to see what options were out there for him. And that break coming out of the situation, going into a hospital situation, is not a great thing. Going to the hospital is not a thing of choice. It's a thing of last resort. If you got somebody who's faced with dying, let's get them out of the situation they're in into a protected environment where we can start offering them all kinds of support, help, options, etc., and help them think their way through the problem because guess what? That problem, as many are, are solvable. But you have to think outside of the box, but you're not thinking outside of the box when you're in that kind of mindset. So suicidal people stay that way until death? No. Treatment helps, and most people get past it. And they, uh, I have a former student, Desiree Stage, who actually has a, a, a website called livethroughthis.org. And what she does is she documents survivors of suicide attempt stories and publicizes them so that other people can see that they're not alone. And that's, that's a student from right here at ETSU and has gone on, survived her own suicide attempt, is brave enough to talk about a suicide attempt in her own life, and brave enough to help other people bring that forward. So this is what we have to get past, the stigma of mental illness. Getting help is what we need. What could you do? You could do another, a number of things. The biggest of which is the last. But take that suicidal talk seriously. Be willing to have a conversation with somebody. One of the problems with depression is that people get socially isolated when they're depressed. You know why? Because it's depressing to talk to depressed people. Right? If things are always down, man, I'd like to talk to them, man. Every time I'm talking to them, they're always talking about how bad things are. Maybe the things will clear up. And people start distancing themselves from people who are suffering because the people are suffering. And the suffering is uncomfortable. So they walk away, not in a mean way, just, I don't know what to do. Well, just provide some empathy. You don't have to be the lifeline. You don't have to be that person's go-to person at 2 a.m. every, you know, week. But... If you can provide a little bit of social support, a little bit of I care about you and you'll make it through this and you're valuable and you should probably seek some additional help. Identify and clar clarify the crucial problem. There's oftentimes one critical issue. There's oftentimes a satellites of other issues that are related, but usually there's one big one that's really, really the roadblock to them seeing a, a future. Suggest alternatives to suicide. You'll get a lot of yes, but, and yes, but, and yes, but. But suggesting alternatives might start them thinking about other alternatives. Capitalize on doubts. I've had one, one person, actually, uh, who said, you know, if it wasn't for my cats, I'd be dead. She loved her cats. She lived totally alone. She thought if she had killed herself, no one would even know. Nobody would discover her body and her cats would die because they wouldn't be fed. And I said, good, feed them cats. Stay alive to feed your cats. Let's start right there. I've had other people say, well, you know, if I didn't think I was going to hell, I'd already be dead. I'm like, good, you might go to hell. I don't know. If that's what you think, let's start right there. Let's keep you alive for a while until we can start working through the issues that are most critical to you. Whatever your doubt is, I'm going to capitalize on that doubt. And I'm going to suggest to you that might be a really good reason. If there's only one reason that you're alive, that is the most important thing in your life right now. Let's, let's support that. And then encourage them to get help with professionals. You can't save everybody. I've got one guy I work with, middle of the night, and I had him sign a contract because I... 
checked his ideation, whether he had a plan, whether he had intent, whether he had any previous histories of suicide attempts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, I don't think you'll need to go to a hospital tonight if you could commit to me, if you'll promise with me a thing called suicide contract and sign that you will meet me tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. so we can talk further. And he goes, signing this isn't going to make me stop. This ain't going to make me not kill myself. I said, I know. I'm asking you to promise me that you won't do it until then. And that if you feel overwhelmed by these feelings, that you will call 911 or that you will call the suicide hotline and that you will get help until we can meet again. If I didn't think you could do that, you would be going to the hospital whether you wanted to or not because I have the power to do that. So you have to work your way through these situations on a case-by-case -case basis for what's best for the person. And professional help is the best thing you can do for them. Get them help.